the knowledge how to do to make fast computation it's it's not a common knowledge people code something but it's not typically it's not very efficient so i think the crucial step in going to many cell system is to share our knowledge uh, how to do those simple tricks in many different languages matlab doesn't suck if you know matlab properly it can be pretty fast and you can also use c++ within matlab the other thing is that when you've got a software like CompuCell 3D and so on, you are narrowing the, down the possible mathematical behaviors. For example, if you want to incorporate T cells inside the tissue, from experiments we know that they go, they travel in the tissue with, uh, using the Levi walks. They do not diffuse. Which software can do that right now? None of them. So it would be great if someone just could with the math knowledge can go to like compute cancer block that I just created, look at the computational tricks and be able to implement millions of cells and do that on his computer, on his desktop. So I just wanted to say that I started a blog and I hope that people will post their parts of their codes just to share the knowledge how to do something fast. I'm not saying about going to billion cells, but going to a million, that's more than enough typically. Thank you. All right. I will talk about broadly my research interest in one slide. Um, so I'm, I'm focused on the lung, and I'm interested in airway inflammation. So there are different triggers of airway inflammation. But the factors that I'm most interested in is cigarette smoke, along with cystic fibrosis, so we have these disease cells that we use in our lab along with normal healthy airway cells, and also the response of airway epithelial cells to different pathogens such as fungal infection. And I would like to incorporate different sources to see how the structure of the airway epithelial cells change, such as the morphology, mucus production, cilia frequency, the way they beat, by incorporating transcriptional data to look at how these different genes changes along with small molecules and ions, because we have different receptors on epithelial cells that will move different um, ions, such as bicarbonate, as well as water. So I'm interested in how these things move and incorporating different ion experimental data measurements. So the overall goal is to determine the population response of airway epithelial cells to some of these different inflammatory genetic or environmental responses, as well as be able to evaluate some of the diversity of these different epithelial cells and the state of the cell based on the initialization of them. And lastly, be able to assess the essential genes and pathways that are related to see how these cells would transition from a normal to more disease state. Uh, hi, my name is Josh Jacobs. I'm with the Christian Swanson um, group, and we specialize in estimating kinetic parameters of glioblastoma, a deadly brain cancer. And I didn't make a slide. I brought a couple of props from uh, uh, <clears throat> snacks this morning. Um, let's just say this apple represents a tumor in somebody's brain, and it's growing. And this orange represents a spherical approxima uh, s spherically symmetric approximation that we use to help derive those parameters. Now, when a tumor meets up against a boundary in the brain, we're not necessarily modeling it's, it's the, the growth and volume appropriately anymore. So what I'm working on lately is how do I take a, uh, adjust a spherically symmetric model to account for some of the boundaries that are encountered in the brain. And the simplest thing is just to take a wedge out of the orange and to model the growth of that uh, clinically observable surface in the brain with just a sort of a, a an adjusted sphere. So thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Farzin. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Santa Fe, California. So my current mentor is Paul Macklin, and my PhD advisor was Nick Bland. So I tried to just show a demo of the project <coughs> I've worked on during my PhD dissertation. All these projects are done using C-Dynamics, the, uh, 
tool that we are trying to, like the manuscript is under preparation. So this is the multi-scale modeling of glioma and immune interactions. And this one is the modeling transition of ductal carcinoma in site to, to invasion. So I try to be silent so we can watch the videos. <laughs> yes, yeah, so these are the tumor cells are, that are growing inside the duct. And this is the work that we do to model the spatiotemporal modeling of biofilm morphogenesis starting from the experimental data. And this is the modeling process of biogenesis that we use our tool to see how, like, to see what, whatever. So these are the projects that I'm currently working on in, as a postdoc. So we are trying to make open source tools that hopefully they would be released soon, hopefully this year. So the physicel and BioFVM, the physicel is a physics-based cell model and BioFVM is a biological transport solver. And this is the final slide that on the project that I'm doing to bioengineer tissues to derive a computational model of colon cancer metastasis in liver. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Vitaly Ganosov. I'm um, in the departments of microbiology and math, and uh, area of expertise is immunology. In this specific project where I feel like there is involvement of multi-cell is about uh, liver stage malaria. So malaria parasites are transmitted by mosquitoes and when, they, uh, when an infected mosquito uh, bites a host, it could be human or a mouse, in this case mouse, uh, it injects a specific stage of the parasite called sporozoites into the skin, which then migrate through the blood, uh, via the blood vessels, uh, via blood uh, to the liver and infect uh, a number of hepatocytes. And um, um, uh, generally, after two days in a mouse, those, uh, those uh, sporozoites will differentiate during that period of time and then go into the blood and cause blood stage malaria. So vaccine strategies, there's a number of vaccine strategies that are aimed at re removing those sporozoites, or they're called also liver stages. And if you vaccinate mice uh, um, to induce T cells, whose job is to find and kill infected cells, they actually can uh, uh, remove all the parasites from the infected mice. And together with our experimental collaborators, we can actually uh, image in the live mouse uh, the parasite and T cells, which can surround the parasite infected cells in vivo. But it all occurs locally, and different parasites will have different numbers of T cells surrounding them. Um, the liver has 100 million cells, approximately, 100 million hepatocytes, so we're under that benchmark of a billion cells. Um, and uh, how those vaccine-induced T cells remove the whole uh, uh, parasites from the whole liver, and they do that because we, we can vaccinate mice and induce high levels of T cells, and then we can protect the mice from the infection. So how do we go from local interactions in the liver around the individual parasites to the whole liver? And can we predict how many T cells are needed to be induced by vaccination to do, to do this protection? That's the question I'm asking. Hi, uh, I'm Jill, and I'm at Moffitt Cancer Center uh, working with Sandy Anderson there as a postdoc. Uh, we also work really closely with uh, the Swanson group. Uh, they do the continuum models, and uh, Peter Canal's group at Columbia and they do these biological models here. Looking mainly at brain cancer, this is a rat brain model, PDF driven glioblastoma. Basically there's a retrovirus that's infected into this white matter and it makes all this PDGF and it picks up these progenitor cells in the area and it makes a big mass. Um, and so what we're doing is looking at the single cell data. We've got tracks over time, we see all the divisions, all these events and measure it and try to hook it up with um, an agent-based model. So what I'm doing is trying to match this agent-based model with the single cell data. Um, and, and to do that, I'm running lots, lots of uh, simulations with different parameter sets. And from that, I can establish kind of this network of uh, how these input parameters are affecting the output parameters that we can get from the models. In the end, 
it's, it's even broader than that. So we can look at this and start to see which parameter sets are actually fitting different things. Like here's the rat model, which is much different than the mouse model, which is much different than the actual human model. Uh, but, but then even getting here and getting a best fit just for the rat model, we can start to tweak around that parameter space and figure out how this affects uh, distributions of selves, patterning, uh, phenotypes, so that eventually we can start looking at treatment and to see how the continuum model fails when you start looking at treatment as of now until you can kind of uh, figure out what the agent-based model is actually contributing extra to, to get that, that heterogeneity to see how treatment might fail. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I just want to show you how we have been working on models of the pancreatic beta cell. You know, it's a cell, uh, the only cell capable of secreting insulin. And the important thing to know about this cell is that uh, it is capable of producing electrical activity, uh, thus allowing the influx of calcium to the intracellular space, which is a key signal for uh, insulin secretion. So based on that, we, are, we have built a model uh, composed of two uh, mm, kind of models of components. One is the single cell or the model of electrical activity where we include all the ionic uh, transfer mechanisms and metabolism, that kind of things. Uh, and this model is coupled with a, a model of the buffer diffusion of calcium, which in, uh, using a, a 3D spherical cell uh, where we can introduce the morphological uh, aspect of the cell. So uh, the idea here is that uh, we, we, can, we can include here how the channels are distributed over the cell membrane, and we can get better, a better estimate of how calcium is, uh, is being increased near the cell membrane, like, like here. For example, this is an electrical pattern produced by, by your model, and this is how Calcium is increasing near uh, two point sources here in the membrane. So the next step for us, we are working on this, is to model uh, an islet because the, the, the beta cell is not uh, isolated in the pancreas. It is uh, coupled with other cells forming islets. So we are trying to uh, go from a single cell to an islet, but this has been uh, a challenge because it is very expensive computationally. Uh, but if you have any ideas how we can do this, please let me know. All right, hello everyone. I'm Vincent from UF, and this is the uh, Many Cell Modeling Workshop. So we're all sitting here at about 30 trillion cells, give or take a trillion maybe. And since I've started talking, about a million of the cells in your body have died, but we're not all shrinking in our seats, right? That's because other cells in your body have divided to replace those cells that have died, and this is just a normal process. We're in a continual flux of our constituent cells. But every time a cell divides, there's a chance for a mutation to occur, and this mutation has a chance to affect the fitness of these cells. So some mutations can either increase the rate at which a cell divides or uh, increase the longevity of a cell and increase the fitness of these cells. And if cells are dividing faster or hanging around longer, a tumor might form, which is the accumulation of cells. Some mutations, most of them will hinder a cell's ability to divide or uh, decrease its longevity, and this will decrease the fitness of an organism, and this will cause various tissues in your body to have an aging phenotype where there's less stem cells replenishing uh, your epithelial layers at the, a constant rate. Uh, so I'm interested in this distribution of fitness effects uh, in somatic tissue, and this distribution of fitness effects has been measured time and time again for whole organisms and mutation accumulation experiments. And my dissertation is focusing on how this process might be different within somatic tissue when we consider a uh, commonly held belief about what this distribution should be for whole organisms, which has been uh, studied before. And I'm looking specifically at our modeling these intestinal stem cell crypts, these little niches. And what's cool about, from an evolutionary perspective, uh, evolution of somatic tissue is not we're, we're not 30 trillion cells we're really just uh, an amalgam of little tiny populations of cells, so maybe six or 20 cells. So it's a many population model of small cells to look at it. And that's how we're, we're comprised. So come by my poster if you want to know more about that. Um, 
Right, hello. Uh, so I'm Helen Byrne. I'm from Oxford, and as I said earlier, I'm still a mathematician. Um, so um, what I've done on here is just put up some pictures of things that I work and or have worked on that I thought might be of general interest to people. Um, and I suppose the sort of themes in the middle that motivate the work that we try to do is a lot of it is around modelling. And I suppose what I should have written in the middle is what's the question. And I think that what's the question, what's the data? That drives the modelling approach that we use, how we simulate the sort of data that might be available in terms of validating the models that we um, develop, and then I suppose completing the loop to make sure that the work is in any sense useful from a biomedical point of view, using that validated model to try and drive predictions. Um, so I um, run the spectrum in terms of the types of models that we develop from continuum PDE models, through to more or less sophisticated multi-scale models and with applications in case you don't know what all of these things are around uh, different aspects of the growth of um, solid tumours which may be avascular or vascularised, uh, wound healing, we just heard about looking at modelling um, early st um, uh, somatic evolution in the intestinal crypt um, so we've looked at developing multi-scale models of the early stages, well, crypt homeostasis, early stages of cancer. Again, a system that I think is interesting, but I don't think has been very well studied. I know there's some cellular POTS models, but the retina, I think, is a very nice model system that might be of interest. So I'll stop there.